Hi there, this is Mike Kramer of Ma Capital. Today is uh, Tuesday, February 27th, and it's around 8.30 New York time. So this week so far has been fairly quiet. I expect that that will begin to pick back up as we go through the balance of this week because we're going to get a lot of economic data that could be market moving. The first piece of news will be coming tomorrow at 8.30, which will be fourth quarter GDP revisions. Uh, analysts are looking for a 3.3% number. Uh, versus 3.3% last month. Personal consumption expected to tick down to 2.7% from 2.8. GDP price index expected to remain unchanged at 1.5%. And core PCE quarter over quarter expected to be 2%. And then on Thursday, the 29th, we're going to be getting the PCE deflator. This is the inflation index that the Fed watches very closely. Uh, estimates are for uh, the PCE to rise by 0.3% versus 0.2%. PCE deflator year over year expected to be 2.4 versus 2.6. Core PCE month over month expected to rise by 0.4 versus 0.2. And core PCE year over year is expected to rise by 2.8 versus 2.9%. Personal income expected to rise by 0.4% versus 0.3. Personal spending expected to move down to 0.2 from 0.7. And then on Friday morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to be getting ISM. ISM prices paid expected to tick higher to 53.2 versus 52.9 last month. ISM manufacturing expected to tick up to 49.5 versus 49.1. So there's plenty of economic data coming the rest of this week. And then next week will be just as busy with the jobs report, of course, next Friday. This leaves us in an interesting spot because we have, uh, as we've been talking about, the 10-year rates and, and rates really across the 5, 7, and 10-year spectrum. Uh, have been sort of hovering around this resistance level at 4.35% now since uh, February 13th. And it seems at this point that the uh, the market is waiting for uh, something. That something could very well be the PCE number that comes on Thursday morning. Uh, you know, clearly this week so far, we've had the two, five, and seven-year treasury auctions. Those have gone off pretty well, no major issues, uh, and so those haven't really uh, ushered in a response into the tre into the treasury market. And so it seems like at this point in time, we're just waiting to find out whether or not treasury yields are going to be moving higher. Uh, and it seems like there's a good chance that they are. And we'll, I'll just briefly touch on that because we have oil prices, which are kind of banging up against the 79 level now for a couple of weeks as well. Clearly, a break above 79 could send oil higher, which in turn could also send 10-year rates higher. Again, this has been a big level of resistance going back for some time, so it's not really surprising to see this type of consolidation happening. Overall, momentum is still overall positive, suggesting also that the 10-year rate is likely to continue to move higher. The two-year rate uh, moved back up to this, this uh, 474 area. This is where we were looking for that to happen. Uh, the next big question is, does the two-year continue to move? Uh, RSI tells you momentum is still positive. RSI suggests that it could still go higher. The um, Bollinger Band also tells you that there's room for the two-year to go higher. And then, of course, if we look at the technical chart, if we were to break above this 474, 475 area, it would also suggest we could potentially move higher back up towards this 5% level, which is a level we haven't seen uh, now really since the end of November and probably a level that not many people expected us to get back to anytime soon. But as the economic data continues to come in hotter than expected, uh, GDP now from the Atlanta Fed model suggesting first quarter GDP growth at 3.2%, you can certainly begin to make a case for higher rates across the entire curve. And of course, we're continuing to watch the dollar index, which has been finding support at the 103.5 area. And this is mostly because the euro has stalled out at resistance around this 108 and a half area. And so while the euro has been sort of moving back up, retracing some of the losses it's seen more recently, if we just take a look at the at this so far, all we've done really is just retrace 38.2% of this decline. And that seems like a totally normal retracement. And what that would sort of suggest to me is that if this is the upper end of the range, if we have done the 38.2% retracement, if we are banging up against the upper Bollinger Band and now are no longer oversold on the euro, if the U.S. data continues to come in hot, if it continues to push rates up, I would think that the dollar starts strengthening against the euro and we start seeing the euro make a move back down towards this 107 area.
area or the lower Bollinger Band. Uh, when we look at the, the pound, the pound has also been basically trending sideways, moving sideways over time. Right now, the pound appears to be overall trending lower. It's moving up towards the upper end of its Bollinger Band. Also, it is um, basically sitting below what I would call resistance at 127.30. So it's possible the pound has a little bit higher to go, potentially to retrace this entire decline. But I think ultimately, like the euro, I think the pound ultimately ends, ends lower with your upside resistance somewhere around 127, while a break below 126.30 opens the door for a return to this 125 area. And when we look at the Japanese yen, the Japanese yen has been starting to weaken again versus the dollar. And that's because, again, rates in the U.S. are starting to move higher. If rates in the U.S. continue to move higher, I think ultimately we'll take out this 150, 150 area on the yen. But remember, this is a very dangerous area and the market is likely to take its time moving higher. This is the area where monetary officials begin to weigh in and start talking about the currency movements and watching the levels. Um, every time we seem to get just slightly higher on the yen, uh, and so it's possible here that we could surpass this 151 and a half area. Maybe we head towards 152. It certainly looks like that's possible. The Bollinger Bands are telling you there's still room to go up into this 150, 175 area. Certainly the RSI is still telling you momentum is bullish. Uh, and certainly even the pattern would suggest that there's still further to go here uh, for the for the yen against the dollar with what looks like uh, a, ri a, a pennant pattern that's formed uh, in the yen currently, which suggests more upside. And of course, when we just look at the spreads between a, a Japanese 10 and a U.S. 10, we know that basically, as we've talked about in the past, the spread between the U.S. 10-year and the Japanese 10-year tends to tell us the direction in which the Japanese yen and the U.S. dollar are going to go. And in this case, that also seems to be suggesting that the dollar continues to strengthen against the yen. So overall, it looks like we're looking at a scenario where rates go higher and dollar strengthens, at least over the short term. When we move over to the, the NASDAQ, um, the NASDAQ continues to um, kind of muddle along right now. It certainly has shown signs of stalling out after NVIDIA's results. What was interesting about NVIDIA's results is that the stock got the market moving higher. I think we talked about in the video last week that surpassing this high could result in the NASDAQ moving back up to this 18,040 level. And if you notice, what's really interesting is that on the day of the results, we got up to that level and we did not surpass it. And then what was also very interesting on the next day is we gapped above it. We sold off immediately and we haven't been able to get back to it or above it since. And uh, what this is potentially setting up is a reversal pattern where it looks like a 2B top. And that's essentially when you currently right here where you get this where you get this big bar higher the next day or the next couple of days later, you move in, you try to take out the previous high, you fail, and then you close down on the day and then below the, the close of the previous of the previous high. And so in this case, on that um, on that Friday, not only did we close below the, the, the Thursday levels, we also closed below the levels of um, February 9th. And to this point, we still haven't really been able to recover that, although today we managed to close just slightly above it. But again, until we really take out this high, uh, this looks like a reversal pattern. Um, additionally, Last week we had this you had this big straight line rally into the close that created this hole in the wall gap. That means that you can potentially come back down and fill this gap at, uh, around 17,480. And certainly if we're looking at a case where we get stronger data where you get rates moving up, you get a dollar strengthening, one would think financial conditions tighten, stocks should move lower. Um, and that would certainly make sense from a, an intuitive standpoint. Uh, and certainly also when we look, we can see there looks to be a broadening, a rising broadening wedge potentially forming, which could also be a bearish pattern overall. When we look at the Dow, basically was able to uh, also gap higher last Thursday. It took out this high. And to this point, uh, the Dow has been using this level as uh, a support level at 38,000. 877. So again, for the Dow, I think we're in a similar spot. If you gap down and you take out this low at 38,870, uh, I think it sets up a gap fill to 38,610, which potentially sets up a return to this 38,100 area. 
Likewise, this remains your resistance and invalidation level at 39,258. You get above that level and obviously you're looking at higher prices. And finally, when we look at the S&P 500, very similar sort of setup to the Dow, much more so than that of the NASDAQ, because like the, uh, the Dow, we gapped higher Thursday, we came down, we haven't even really come back down to test support yet on the S&P, and then we had this kind of grinding lower motion in the S&P for most of today, and then we got this little breakout at the end of the day, and so the question is, is do we gap higher tomorrow and try to promptly take out this high Again, I think it's going to largely depend on what the economic data is. If the data comes in hotter uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, I think that sets up the chance that you're going to see, like the NASDAQ, the S&P gap lower and eventually refill this gap at 4980 but Like the Dow, if we were to move higher and take out this high at 5110 I think that likely sets up a further gain I think it's also important to remember, again, for the S&P, the call wall right now is around that 5,100 level, and that's also likely to, to serve as a, a support and resistance level. And then uh, the one other thing that I will point out when we look at the S&P, at least on the Bollinger Band level, you can see we were overbought. We we're coming back down through it now. When we look at it on the weekly, not quite overbought, but you're overbought on the RSI. And when you look at the monthly, you have a, a condition where you're uh, almost a complete bar outside of the upper Bollinger Band. And uh, while the RSI is still at 66 and a half, we don't usually get too many months in a row where you get these months where you're rising above, you're at or above the upper Bollinger Band. So I would be careful here as well because the month isn't over yet and you could easily see a slip back below that lower bo that upper Bollinger Band comes at 4,991. So that's also worth uh, being aware of. Anyway, um, hope you have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you next. Bye.